Jay Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective who's been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Dateline, and Court TV. Now, we join him as he applies his investigative skills to making a case for Christianity. Thanks for joining us at Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Today, I want to answer the question, was Jesus truly predicted by the prophets of the Old Testament? Some people reject some of the predictions, some of the prophecies they don't think are valid. Well, I'm going to examine those with you in a talk from my upcoming book, Person of Interest. Actually, it's available right now online, everywhere that books are sold. Uh, at a conference I did where we're just talking about the fuse of prophecy that leads up to the appearance of Jesus. Enjoy. Look. I've had cases where, you know, a guy commits a crime and it turns out that not everyone was surprised that he did it. As a matter of fact, there are sometimes witnesses who will say, yeah, I can see this coming. You know, I've known this, this couple for a number of years. I saw the fights developing. I could have predicted this would have happened. Well, you know, it turns out that there's people when it comes to Jesus who had a similar experience. They, they could have predicted. They, not everyone was surprised that the Messiah appeared when he did. As a matter of fact, both the writers in the Old Testament and the writers in the New Testament have a high regard for prophecy. Let me show you what Isaiah says in the Old Testament. He says, remember, the former things long passed, for I am God. God is speaking now through Isaiah. And there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. Declaring the end this is what God does. He declares the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So the ancients before Jesus knew that God had the ability to predict the beginning from uh, the end, rather, from the beginning. Now, interestingly, the New Testament writers had a very similar high regard for God's ability to do this. As a matter of fact, Peter writes it this way, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inqu inquiries seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. In other words, the New Testament authors were aware of the long tradition of prophets who were looking for, predicting, and pointing to the coming Messiah. What we're talking about here, of course, is prophecy. And I know there's lots of pastors, and you've probably read books. Maybe you've got this, uh, there's people who I would say, hey, what do you think the strongest evidence is for Jesus being you know, God? They'll say, well, it's prophecy. It's fulfilled prophecy. Well, I'm going to tell you, that's, I, I can see why somebody would say that. Because look at it this way. In the New Testament, the authors of the Gospels, they cite Old Testament prophecy almost 60 times. But my question, of course, as a new investigator was, why would anyone think this is all that impressive? I'll be honest. As I listened to people tell me that prophecy predicted Jesus, I actually went to those Old Testament prophecies and I was decidedly underwhelmed. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something. I was recently contacted by a, a, a young man who's been working on the staff of a very well-known evangelist here in Southern California had been on this staff for years, you know, uh, setting up interviews, setting up all kinds of, I had appeared on this person's show. Uh, the staffer was a committed Christian, but eventually deconstructed, you've heard that expression, from his faith. And he said he did it based on the fact that he no longer believed that the prophecies that were usually cited by New Testament authors were legitimate prophecies to begin with. In other words, he felt like those New Testament authors were twisting somehow the scriptures that allegedly prophesied about the appearance of Jesus and making them fit their own narrative, much the way that sometimes Mormon authors would do, or you know, Joseph Smith would twist prophecy in order to predict something that Joseph did. Now, I'm going to talk to you about that because I had a similar feeling. Let me just, before I begin to kind of uh, show you what I'm talking about, let me just kind of walk you through a couple of things that I have learned as an investigator that will help us to discover if the prophecies of the Old Testament are really all that powerful. First of all, um, it's not unusual for us to work cases in which we have an informant who will tell us something about the crime. He has some inside information, he or she, and they will tell us something. And there is actually a legal definition of what these kinds of informants are. And I'll read it to you, okay? A definition of an informant 
is a person who has a history or track record of providing accurate information to, to officers. Uh, if qualified as tested, a tested informant, he or she will be presumed reliable unless there is reason to believe otherwise. In other words, this is according to a, a trial, a, a Supreme Court case. Now, th this is what we, this is the definition of what it is to be a reliable informant. Basically what it means is they have had to predict that, uh, to, to, to say, to give you information that you then found out was true as part of your investigation. And once that happens and they've been tested, they actually have provided information that you discover is correct. They can be called a reliable informant. And this is an RI, a reliable informant, or a CRI, which is just a confidential reliable informant. Something similar happens theologically in the Old and New Testament, uh, not in terms of, of, of um, uh, informants as much as in terms of prophets. Let me show you the definition of a prophet, according to Moses. It's a person who, quote, speaks in the name of the Lord. If the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, if that's the case. You shall not be afraid of him. Moses tells us this in Deuteronomy 18, verse 22. What he's basically saying is that a prophet of God has to be 100% correct all the time. In other words, it's kind of like a reliable informant. If my informant's wrong half the time, I can't call him reliable. If your prophet is wrong half the time, you cannot call him reliable either. Now, the question then becomes, well, how would I know which of the prophets of the Old Testament could really be considered reliable? Ah, I'm glad you asked that question. It turns out that several of the Old Testament prophets predicted historical events in addition to predicting the coming Messiah. And these historical events actually occurred. Now, not every prophet has done that. Not every prophet even makes a prediction about something historically, uh, an event that's going to occur in history. But some do. Let me just show you a few of these so you can, all of them, so you can see them here. Nahum, for example, uh, predicts the destruction of Nineveh. But he, he prophesizes it just a few years before it actually happens. So uh, for me, as an atheist skeptic, I was like, really? A couple of years, or, I mean, that's just too close to the event. I mean, how do you know when he actually wrote it? Maybe he wrote it when it actually happened. But if you accept the dating of Old Testament scholars, this is a prophecy of Nahum that actually occurred the destruction of Nineveh. Um, okay, that's two years prior to his destruction. To me, it was a little bit too tight. Okay, let's just go one more. Uh, how about um, Isaiah? Isaiah predicts the destruction of Babylon. And that prediction occurs actually a lot earlier than the Nahum prediction. That's back, back about 150 years. That was more impressive to me, right? Predicts that destruction, it actually occurs. A lot of people, for example, skeptics, will do their best to twist everything and do their best to try to put Isaiah dated at a different time because they hate the fact that he was actually able to do this accurately. Let me go another one. Turns out that Ezekiel predicts the destruction of Tyre. Now he prophesizes this about, uh, actually pretty impressive, about 100, over 150 years prior to it actually occurring. So we have another um, pretty good gap in time. Another prophet who predicts something that's going to happen in history and history reveals that his prediction was accurate. Uh, this is also true of Jeremiah. Jeremiah predicts the destruction of Edom, and he predicts it at actually a pretty decent clip ahead of when it actually occurs, almost 500 years before it occurs. So he, I think, can be considered reliable just because of that. Daniel, for example, predicts the, uh, the end of the reign of Alexander the Great. He predicts also, and by the way, that prediction is pretty uh, far in advance of it actually occurring, over 200 years. And then he predicts the reign of the Roman Empire. And so now you'll see this prediction occurs over a much longer period of time, about 500 years years again prior to its peak. Now, why am I showing you all this? They're on a timeline here. I've put them on this timeline so you can see where they occur, where the prophecy occurs. That's where the little uh, quill is. And then when the actual event occurs, that's where the piece of architecture is. And you will see that over and over again, you've got these reliable informants in the sense that they are prophets who make an accurate prediction. Now, I'm just for the sake of argument, because you know I'm a jerk, I'm going to toss out the one that's Nahum because it's only a couple of years between. So let's say you just were really skeptical about that dude. Fine. Toss them out. You're still going to be stuck with the other ones. And all of these, these four reliable um, informants, point to the coming Messiah. Now, they are joined by a bunch of others. And so I'm going to look at all of these. Because it's clear from the predictions that something is about to happen. Someone is coming. And, and if all you did was look at these four that you consider to be reliable, 
that would be enough for me but i'm going to show you all of it because i want you to see it but i'm going to show it to you in a way that you maybe have never thought about it before because i'm going to show it to you in terms of its chronology when did it occur in history before i do that though i want to make a distinction that i think was troubling for me as an atheist remember i told you about that staffer of a local ministry here who was having problems with this and actually was deconverting from christianity because he thought that the the people who were quoting uh, pr prophecies in the new testament the new testament authors were really twisting these prophecies here's why he thought that because like me he thought you know what these prophecies they're citing as messianic jews don't think those are messianic I'm reading the plain text in the Old Testament. And I'm thinking, I wouldn't even assume this is messianic. This seems like it's describing the nation of Israel or it's describing something that David did. Why would you think this is describing a future coming Messiah? Like, I mean, if you look at all these New Testament, half these dang things don't even seem like they're talking about the Messiah. And if you ask an ancient Jew, they would never have said that was even messianic to begin with. So if you're going to use those kinds of statements you happen to clip out of the Old Testament to make your case for Jesus, I'm out. That was his view. Okay. Well, there's two kinds of evidence in a crime scene. I'm going to show it to you here on this timeline. So here's my suspect here um, on my timeline. Uh, let's go ahead and move him over a little bit. So there he is. Now, uh, I'll give you two kinds of evidence. Let's say, for example, that he um, left um, a, a, a shoe print or even better, like DNA or a fingerprint. If he left a DNA print or a fingerprint or a shoe print, I could actually identify him before I put the shoe print. Let's say he left DNA. Well, that would be very clear evidence. If his DNA happens to be in a national database, I could identify my suspect from DNA and fingerprints before this dude ever even shows up. In other words, if I had a question, who's my suspect? I don't know who my suspect is. Well, I've got DNA at the crime scene. I've got fingerprints at the crime scene. Well, that kind of stuff points to a person of interest. Clear evidence like DNA and fingerprints point to a criminal before I ever meet him. So I can figure out who this guy is before I ever knock on his door. I'll know which door to knock on based on the clear evidence. Let me go to another kind of evidence that you sometimes find at crime scenes, like a button. Really? Is that button from the victim? I don't see a button missing on the victim's shirt. Or how about a hairband? Is that button or is that hairband from the... I one time had a piece of shoe foam left at a crime scene. Well, you cannot identify uh, the suspect in advance. I'm not even sure these things belonged to the suspect. I knew they belonged to somebody. Now, if I meet the suspect years later or a couple of days later, and I find that his shirt is missing a button, well, then I would go, oh, this actually is evidence of a crime. This is cloaked evidence. We have clear evidence in every crime scene. We have cloaked evidence in every crime scene. Here's what I mean. This is the kind of evidence that after I identified, maybe with DNA, a suspect from the clear evidence, well, then I can, when I meet him, that turns out this cloaked evidence, if it matches his torn shirt or whatever, well, okay, that's going to identify him. In other words, clear evidence identifies the person of interest before he's identified. Cloaked evidence identifies the person of interest after he's identified. In other words, once I meet him, I can look at his shoe. Oh, it's missing foam. Oh, he had long hair. He's missing a hairband. Oh, he has a shirt that's missing a button. Well, now all of these things that would not seem clear, didn't even seem to clearly point to my suspect before the murder. Well, now this stuff actually helps me to identify the suspect after the fact. Well, it turns out, I think you know where I'm headed with this, that prophecy is often like that. There are some prophecies that are so clear that when I read them, even before Jesus ever appeared, the first readers of that scripture would say, oh, clearly this is describing a coming Messiah and it's describing him in a clear way. So these are the kinds of prophecies that would point to our Messiah before we ever meet him, just like other clear evidence in a crime scene. Now, there's other kinds of, of prophecies that are much more like the button, right? They're cloaked. Uh, they may or may not, be, maybe you wouldn't even see them necessarily as belonging to the suspect. But after you meet the suspect, you'll find out, actually, you know what? Those things match the suspect. They identify him after the fact. So once again, clear evidence points to the suspect beforehand. Cloaked evidence confirms the suspect after the fact. Keep this in mind because this is a huge, um, I hope it opens your eyes a little bit because um, what typically I see happening is people who are making a case for Jesus from prophecy, they lump these two kinds of, of prophecies together. And then we're looking at it and thinking, this is lame. 
Why should I trust any of your prophecies when half of them seem like they're not that clear? They're all cloaked. You can make anyone look like the, kid, the fact after uh, after the case, after the fact. You can make anyone look like a suspect, right? So I want to show you now on the timeline, I want to show you the earliest prophecies um, as they come in place on the timeline. So let's go to our timeline. Here's Jesus. I'll push him over to the edge here. Don't you wonder? This is the fuse that's burning up to Jesus, the prophetic fuse. Don't you wonder why Jesus appeared when he appeared? Like, why didn't he come earlier or why didn't he come later? Don't you wonder about that? Is there something about this prophetic fuse that dictates his arrival and when it'll occur? Yeah, yeah, actually there is. And so what we're going to do is use those six investigative terms. Here's five. These five investigative questions will eventually lead us to the most important question. Who is the Messiah? So what we're going to do is ask these five questions to get to the sixth. Now, here we are charting our, the first fuse starts to burn. Here are the first prophets who say anything about the coming Messiah. And that's Job, probably one of the most ancient scriptures, and Moses. Now, I'm going to put on the screen for you in white, those are the clear prophecies. And in yellow, those are the cloaked prophecies. In other words, uh, I, I want to eliminate the cloaked prophecy. So if we were to make a list right now of just what Moses and Job gives us, I'm only going to include the, the clear prophecies, just for sake of argument. Just the clear prophecies. I'm with you if you're skeptical about prophecy and how it's used to make a case for Jesus. I am too. So here we are. This is what you get from the earliest prophecies. And guess what? Pretty much every question that you have is still left unanswered. Even the few questions that are addressed are not addressed deeply enough to be able to predict. If Jesus showed up right here in history, nobody would even know he matched any prophecy or matched the expectation of the Messiah because not enough has been prophetically uttered about the Messiah. That might be why Jesus doesn't come that early. Let's go a little further in history. The, the fuse burns a little further to the next group that starts to speak about Jesus. And most of their utterances, because a lot of them are psalmists, are cloaked. They're all the orange ones, all the yellow ones here. Only the ones in white would I consider to be all that clear. So those are the only ones that I am willing to include on my list. So here I am now updating my list. This is the updated list. I will underline on this list the new stuff. But if you look at this, okay, it's a little better, but it really doesn't answer. I mean, I think it's still pretty obscure who it is we should be expecting. If Jesus was to appear at this point in history, I think most of us would be scratching our heads. Anyone would be expecting it would be scratching their head. So let's burn down that fuse a little further. And now we got a bunch more, right, of people who are offering. Uh, and I went back and looked at every, even uh, if you thought it was cloaked, clear, whatever, I put them on my list. So here are the prophecies, it both the ones that are clear or white, the ones that are yellow or clo cloaked. I just want you to see that now some of these questions are starting to become better answered. Not great, but some are better than they were answered before. So there's the new information. Yeah, okay, so maybe you can say, well, I was born in Bethlehem. The where question's kind of been answered now, but the other questions haven't been. These other questions are still on the table. Let's burn that fuse down a little bit further. So here's that fuse burning down to the next set of prophecies. That's going to be Isaiah. Oh, my gosh. Isaiah, let me tell you, uh, pretty much Isaiah says a lot about the coming Messiah. So there's all the stuff he says that I think is pretty clear. And again, you know, in our book, we've got this all in the footnotes. Of course, in a presentation like this, you're going to trust me for this. Uh, here's the stuff that is, is cloaked from Isaiah. So if I was going to update the list of information and include Isaiah's information on this list, he actually helps us answer a couple more questions. So now we've got a bunch of new information. I'll underline it on this list for you. That's not bad. We're getting closer. Uh, I think if Jesus was to come right at this point in history, I mean, you'd be pretty close, but you really wouldn't. I mean, I'm not sure people would even know really the when question is, is big for me. Like, when should I expect him? And that's really not answered here. We still have the why, the when, and the who questions. They're pretty open. So let's burn that fuse down a little further. So now we're going to burn down to the appearance of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and a couple of other psalmists that are writing in this period. And here is the clear prophecy from those prophets. And the cloaked is in the orange and the yellow again. 
So I will update my list. And again, I know this is a lot of information quickly, but just bear with me. Um, this is what it would look like. And of course, in that book, that's why we write books, because books are really the best way to get the most detailed information. But here is, for example, the updated. Now, it's, it's better, a little bit better. Only a couple of new things really have uh, been added to my list. So to be honest, I still have the same three open questions. Let's go a little further. Now we're going to go to Daniel. Daniel's going to be so helpful, right? Because Daniel's actually going to provide us with um, some clear and cloaked, well, clear evidence, uh, clear prophecy here. And I want to just focus on the bottom half of your screen here. It's it's Daniel that's going to tell us, uh, give us a pretty tight range. He says this 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 Messiah is going to come between the the um, decree that's going to be issued to rebuild Jerusalem. Now we can kind of get an idea of when that would happen in history from his, just from history itself. And then uh, he'll appear also though before the temple and is destroyed. Well, I know that happens in seventy A.D. So now we're getting a place where if we took this information and updated our list, ah, we're really getting close to knowing when. We've got a range there, when, right? But just to make it clear, I'll put this on the on the screen as well. I'm leaving the when question just kind of like semi-transparent, like there's, it's good, I could be a little better, but it's not bad, right? Now we're gonna come down to the last prophets and the last prophets really kind of lock it in for us and they kind of help us to answer all the questions as a matter of fact it's i think malachi who tells us that um again he confirms that now we're closer to that period of time when jesus is going to appear and he's telling us that he'll have to appear at a point when he can enter the temple he suddenly enters the temple that means the temple still has to be in place before and we know according to um to uh, Daniel that is before it's destroyed. So now we got a better sense of, of the time frame in which Jesus is going to show up. So I'm just going to update my list of characteristics of the Messiah. And now I actually think that every question that you could answer has been pretty satisfactorily answered. And now you kind of see why history is aligning to a point when really the only open question is the who question. And if you've got all the other questions answered, it's much easier to answer the who question. So let's go take a look at our Jesus right now. And remember, we're going to look at two kinds of prophecies. Clear prophecies, I'll put those on the left, and cloaked prophecies, we'll put those on the right. So let's take a look at our clear prophecies. Um, this, not bad. These are clear prophecies that point to Jesus. Now, now I, I think there's enough here to identify Jesus. But if there wasn't, you could always look back in hindsight and ask the question, well, what do the cloaked prophecies say? And the cloaked prophecies really lock it down. But I get it. You might say, I don't like all those cloaked props. I don't trust them. Well, yeah, but that's the whole point. You would allow a crime scene investigator to examine evidence that's in a crime scene that's cloaked and actually matches his shirt afterwards. That's still in the game. That makes sense that you would allow that. Why would you not allow that here? Many times the authors in the New Testament are provided, they're talking about the, the clear evidence, but then they're also saying, hey, guys, we found a button and the button happens to match the cloak, the, 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 the shirt. So they're showing you cloaked evidence. That's legitimate. It's legitimate in every crime scene. Do not let the fact that some is cloaked and some is clear. This stuff that's cloaked, that button, that, that hairband, that piece of shoe foam, that stuff matters. Not only that, it turns out that most, there's a lot of this cloaked stuff is actually just a repeat of the stuff that's in the clear evidence. So I'm going to cross that stuff out. This is the stuff that's actually on the clear side. So you could remove it from the cloak side. Uh, because you don't really need it. So this is really the only stuff on the cloak side that we're including anyway. And I think if you look at all that stuff, you're going to find that Jesus of Nazareth is the best candidate for the who question. And look, if you said, you know, Jim, I'm only willing to consider the reliable informants. Okay, well, it turns out that the reliable informants, if just Isaiah really tells you enough to lock down Jesus. That's a pretty robust description of Jesus just from Isaiah. Okay, and, and if you look at the other uh, four that are there, well, it turns out the other four give you, or the three rather, give you a bunch more stuff that is um, helpful. So if you just, so I'm, I'm only going to look at the clear evidence from the reliable, the four reliables, you would have enough, I think, to make the case that Jesus actually fits it. So let's go back and take a look at our timeline again. So if you look at these, the prophets, they're pointing toward a person of interest. And it's clear that there's a person of interest coming. 
you know, a redeemer, a, a restorer, a messiah, a savior is coming. And they are pointing, but who is the savior? Well, they're pointing to someone and it turns out there's a reason why this savior comes when he does, because as that prophetic fuse is burning down toward the appearance, the end of the BC or the BCE before the common era and the beginning of the common era, these questions are being answered and that sequence until finally the only question left to answer is the who question. Come in this fall, join me, Jay Warner Wallace. We'll investigate a real homicide together. We'll also examine the unparalleled impact Jesus had on human history. Does Jesus still matter in a world that's increasingly skeptical of the Bible? Let's discover if Jesus is history's true person of interest. Do you get a sense that censorship is rising? If we simply just reiterate the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth, there's a good chance someone in the culture is gonna see that as intolerant. I'm Jay Warner Wallace, cold case detective and Christian case maker. If you're concerned like I am about being deplatformed, about being canceled by a culture that has control over your mechanisms to interact with each other, and that's what it is with social media, then please join us at a private community we are building at coldcasechristianity.com. And I want you to join us if you're interested in being mentored, in being discipled in a way that will help you become a better Christian case maker. It's a platform where you can know, is the Bible true and does it matter? Those two things will change your life. Join us at coldcasechristianity.com. You won't regret it. In addition to Jim's daily blog and weekly podcasts and videos, Jim continues to write books designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. These resources will help you defend what you believe and share it with others. I hope that helps you to see why I clarify and try to separate uh, cloaked from clear prophecies. I actually think that this helps us to better understand how the evidence can be used to assemble a case for Jesus. And do I think that case is persuasive? Yes, you can read more about it in my new book, Person of Interest. And for those of you who are interested in purchasing it, you can go to our website at personofinterestbook.com. I'll see you here next week at Cold Case Christianity. To hear more from Jay Warner Wallace, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For more information on this week's topic, visit youtube.com slash coldcasechristianity with Jay Warner Wallace. Thank you for joining us on this Cold Case Christianity broadcast.